Uh, that may be a plus or a minus, or I'm not sure. Uh, I'm gonna, took me a long time to figure out why I was here. Um, and I'm still not sure. Uh, I have over time done a fair bit of work on analyzing networks, but uh, I like to point out that statistical models for networks are very different than what many people from uh, the computer science community do. And I like, I have multiple appointments at Carnegie Mellon, one of which is in the Department of Machine Learning, uh, where we attempt to meld approaches from statistics with approaches from computer science. And over the years, we've realized that students coming from the different perspectives bring very different ideas and ways of thinking to the table. If you take two students coming into the program, one from statistics and one from computer science, and you present them with a real problem, and you ask the statistics student what to do, uh, they'll go off and spend a lot of time asking what the motivation for the problem is. Uh, if you're very lucky, uh, at the end of the first week, they will have formulated a simple statistical model, and by the end of the month, uh, they would ask about how to apply the model and some generalized estimation scheme to the data set that was the motivation. You give the same data set and problem to a computer science student coming into our program and the first thing they do is they take an algorithm, they apply it, and they get an answer. It does not matter how big the problem is, they always get an answer. Uh, the algorithm, uh, at some point as they adapt, it always converges, and they produce a set of numbers. If you ask the students to talk to each other about this problem, sometimes what they've done overlaps, and many times not. And uh, at the end of their second year, if you gave them the same problem again, you might discover that the algorithm that the computer scientist brought to bear on the problem is actually one that's relevant for the class of models that might have been relevant for the data. So I give you that as a, as a, a prologue to what I'm going to do. I'm really going to talk about how statisticians think about some of these problems. And it usually begins after an understanding of the data, because you begin with the data, to focus on classes of probability models with parametric specifications, or even uh, perhaps uh, semi-parametric specifications. And if you're lucky, you can identify core components, which we call sufficient statistics, but uh, in other parts of the world, there's summary statistics. And then you would formulate some type of estimation scheme that has known classes of properties. And lastly, you want to make sure that the models you formulated actually provide reasonable fits to the database or data set. So I'm going to focus on this. I'm going to look at static models, that is, uh, models representing either a snapshot of a network or the cumul accumulation of data on a network up to a given point in time, so that there is only one picture of a network which you can represent with a graph. And I'll think about nodes and edges in the graph. Um, the literature on network modeling predates computer science. Uh, I know that computer scientists sometimes have a hard time understanding that. Uh, uh, but it goes back uh, almost a century. And these are data from a study that emerged in, so, uh, by, uh, gathered by a sociologist uh, who lived in a monastery and uh, observed the behavior of the monks 
and 18 novates over a period of two years. And he ultimately wrote his uh, PhD thesis about this. And you have network data that he formally gathered at four points in time. Um, and so you've got friendship measured three times. You've got other components. Here we're thinking of a multivariately structured graph. And in the bottom corner over there uh, is a summary version. The dark squares correspond to the existence of a tie where uh, the noviate for the row sends, uh, declares a link to the noviate uh, for the column. Uh, these are constrained to add to three, a typical social science or sociology study usually, thank you. Limits the number of friendship links to three. Uh, people do not behave. And so if you're actually very good at this and look across the rows, you'll discover that some of them total four or more. Uh, so why, why are the friendship matrices not symmetric? I can't hear. Why are they not symmetric, the friendship? Oh, you may think that I'm your friend. <laughs> but I don't know who you are. Yeah. Okay? And indeed, one of the models I'm going to lay out really brings that to the fore. I, I titled this social networks, but the kinds of applications that have been on the table for a long time include uh, uh, applications in biology. And going from 18 to 871, is both a scale issue now and a shift of things. The adjacency matrix here is symmetric. So the fact that you wanted the other ones to be symmetric had to do with the substance of the problem. And here, uh, we don't have any directionality. And uh, I always find it surprising to people who look at this, that's a sparse adjacency matrix. Uh, that's because there are 871 rows and columns. And so sparsity here is really part of the structure. Uh, all right, so what am I going to do? I'm going to tell you about the simplest social network model with structure that people have looked at. Uh, I'm going to throw some notation up. And then uh, I'm really going to run through, for each of three classes of models, one that builds on that and two others that are somewhat related, aspects of estimation algorithms and their properties, and big issues. And then I'm going to end with two points, one about model choice and model fit, and a bunch of other challenges. I'll tell you about a really big data set that I'm involved in gathering, or it's about to get gathered, where you could think of embedding the kinds of models that I'm going to describe in a much bigger and broader context. Uh, the data I'm going to focus on are adjacency matrices. The zero, the entries are zeros and ones. Think nodes in the graph, links between the nodes being one if there exists a link, and these can be symmetric or asymmetric depending on the class of models. And I'll throw in one that has symmetry in its structure, although we could make it asymmetric uh, uh, later on. Uh, for uh, these structures, typically the nodes, we have covariates. Uh, and many of these models have latent structure. 
And by and large, the latent variables are going to be Zs, and sometimes they're directed, sometimes not directed. And parameters are around with uh, profusion. I thought I gathered them all up, but I realized that there's some alphas in the first transparency. Uh, for Bayesians, and I'm a Bayesian, uh, latent variables are just random variables. And so as I think about the models I'm going to describe, even though I'll tell you a little about maximum likelihood estimation for some and the like, um, I tend to be thinking about structures where I'll put distributions on random variables, I'll put distributions on parameters, and I'll build up levels in a hierarchical structure. You won't see the hierarchy for all of the models that I'm going to do. Um, some of these models have really great heuristics, and they will link to things that people do in a broad array of computer science. For some, for these, the, the, there are these summary statistics, and you'll say, oh, that's what we do. And then for others, the data are the sufficient statistics, which means that the problem is much more complicated, even though the heuristic about the model uh, might, might be uh, quite com compelling. The simplest models treat edges as being independent of one another. And if they all have the same distribution, that's the erdos renyi model. And somewhat more complex models focus on dyads, pairs of nodes and their links, and treat them as independent. Once you get past dyadic independence, all of the world of statistics changes. And you need to build in something in order to get a statistical hold on some of these models, even though you're working with the ensemble. So let me begin with the, what I call the Hull and Leinhardt model, which in some senses is a natural takeoff um, on Erdős Renyi. And I want you to focus on a pair of individuals. So my friend here is I, and I'm J. And if the probability of his sending a link to me is unique to our dyad. So this is just a normalizing constant, lambda j. So forget about it. Uh, he sends a link with a sending parameter alpha i. I receive it with link to parameter beta j. And there's an edge parameter that's a, there for sucking out the, basically the average, if you want to think about that. So here's the edge parameter. So he sent this link. This is in the log scale. Uh, with his alpha, I receive it with beta. If we do it the other way around, it's my alpha and his beta. And if he sends a link to me first and I reciprocate, I'm going to add a reciprocal component, rho ij. Well, count parameters, and you'll suddenly realize that we're already uh, non, in a non-identifiable world. Oh, a dyad can be in one state and only one state. So you could think of a two by two table with a one for one cell and zeros for the rest. And I've laid out those probabilities for you. And now I have to do something with this model. If I get rid of reciprocation, this is like a generalized erdos renyi model. Uh, I'm interested in reciprocation, because that gives you tightness within uh, blocks. And that's the Holland and Leinhardt model. But you can make it dependent on nodes. And that's, there's some nice generalizations there. Uh, let me take the Holland and Leinhardt model, because it's quite instructive. And I put it all together, and I compute the likelihood function combining the probabilities for all of the die heads, and lots of things add up because I assume independence of dyadic relationships. And now that's the total number of edges in the graph, and that multiplies the edge parameter. 
Uh, this is the out degree for the ith node, the in degree for the jth node, and this is a sum of uh, a reciprocity sum. So that's the number of reciprocal nodes. Okay, really heuristic. And you notice there was this generative description that I gave you, which led to the structure that I laid out here. Um, that's a well-known structure. That is the form of uh, exponential family. Uh, you would think that this would be really easy statistically to deal with. So we have these summary statistics. And Max, the exponential family theory tells us how to solve them. We set these quantities equal to their expectations under the model. It's a set of equations. There's efficient ways of doing that. My favorite still remains interproportional fitting or an iterative scaling algorithm. Uh, its properties in general are what I label superlinear convergence. Uh, there are some special cases where you get only linear convergence. In practice, you get uh, close to quadratic convergence in lots of settings. Uh, there's problems when it scales, and there's a big caveat. Because I've assumed that there's parameters associated with individuals, and if individuals don't, for example, receive links, uh, then these estimates don't exist. There's maximization on the boundary. And uh, there are internal constraints in these matrices that are very, very subtle. And uh, in an unpublished paper, we actually now know how to characterize that. Uh, but it's taken something like 30 years statistically to understand these models. So we've got uh, an algorithm that works. There's probably better ones. Uh, but remember, we're interested in this as the size of the network grows. Uh, there are two big computational issues. How do you figure out when estimates exist and deal with the problem of zeros uh, associated with sending and receiving and assessing fit? And I'm going to come everything has this problem. Why is that a problem? Because I have to assess a fit relative to the adjacency matrix. And it means computationally, as things scale, um, I have a problem. I also have a statistical problem here, because as the size of the network grows, I have two sets of parameters that are marching off to infinity with the size. And so there's statistical estimation problems. You can solve that by being Bayesian if you want, but then you lose characteristics of individual nodes. All right, so one of the three classes that I want to summarize for you, one is referred to as exponential random graph models. It builds on the kind of structure I just showed you. There's something referred to as latent space models. And finally, I'll, I'll do a little bit on mixed membership stochastic block models. Actually, all of these models, in many senses, have been motivated by trying to find structure within blocks within networks. The physicists like to call that community discovery. It goes under dozens of different names, depending on who's writing the paper and where they're publishing it. But one version of it is to think about the adjacency matrix as being structured in diagonal blocks. And we know that isn't quite correct, but you hope to get the densest part of the, uh, the network by permuting rows and columns and then having those blocks. Um, you need embellishments of that, and the mixed membership models are one version of doing that, and there are variants of the others that do it as well. All right, so exponential random graph models look just like the model I told you. Uh, so if I took logs here, 
I just have to worry about this kappa function, but this turns out to be a sum of linear components. And you can think of these guys over here as being the summary statistics. And much of the literature said, oh, well, tell me what motif in the data you like. You like triangles? Put them in over here, and then you'll have a parameter associated with triangles in the exponential random graph structure. You like four stars? That's a four star. Oh, five stars are easier, I guess. Uh, put five stars in. Uh, you can think of this as having that kind of structure. There are other special versions of these that are, in fact, nicer. So for your purposes, think edges and triangles, because I'm going to come back, and maybe two stars, because I'll come back to that in a minute. The problem with these models right at the outset is that nothing is independent of anything else. Once I break down dyadic independence and look at the ensemble, I can write out a probability function like this. But I can't do the story that my friend and I were doing in our exchange for the Holland and Leinhardt model. The lack of that is really problematic statistically as well. And the estimation turns out to be problematic as well. When people first saw these, they said, ah, that's OK. We don't have to maximize, get parameters that maximize that. Let's look at dyads separately, or nodes separately, and write out a logistic function for everything associated with a node perspective on the graph. There's one for every node. There's one for every pair of edges. OK? And now you can act, act or act for every edge. And you can create a bunch of these logistic regression models and glue them together and fit them each separately, basically. That's called pseudo-maximum likelihood estimation. It's based on looking at this. That's really fast to do, as long as things exist, which they don't always do. Uh, whereas maximum likelihood estimation uses that full likelihood function. And you need to worry about computing the normalizing constant. And that's the really hard problem. So um, for estimation, what people have focused on is, is methods that get kappa. Pseudo-maximum likelihood estimation, they say, oh, well, we just know how to do that, and let's go running off and make it happen. So what are the algorithms? Well, it's some form of Markov chain Monte Carlo for the full estimation. Those are algorithms that people have implemented. They run on as many as 1,000 nodes, sometimes slowly. Um, and as I said, they're really there to get the normalizing constant right. If you like logistic regression, take your most efficient algorithm and make it work. So what's the problem? This is really computationally intensive and accurate in the sense of maximizing the right function. And the methods scale to a medium level. Pseudo likelihood methods are really simple and scale to any size network you want. Uh, the problem is they estimate something other than what you want to estimate in many <coughs> cases. So in the first instance, we have serious difficulties in figuring out whether or not these estimates have problems, and I'm going to show you uh, an example of that in very small dimensions. But as things scale, it gets so complicated, uh, you're not really sure. And you can get what I'll call near degeneracy problems, which is the biggest issue. Sort of thinness of the space where you're doing the maximization, and often steep cliffs uh, that you fall off the edge of 
if you're not careful. Uh, it turns out that the pseudo-estimates also have existence problems uh, because they exist when maximum likelihood estimates don't. Some people think that's a good thing. I happen to think it's a bad thing for the, for the purposes that I'll show you in a minute. And uh, let me skip to that. Uh, here's a, an edges and triangles model and, um, for nine nodes. And here's an entropy plot in the natural parameter space. So this is the triangle parameter and the edge parameter, and blue is bad. And you've got these ridges, and it turns out that no matter uh, what you think you're doing, you're always near a boundary. And uh, algorithms don't converge very fast there. And indeed, there's something systematic about the models that are problems. Latent space models take a somewhat different form. Uh, they're motivated by the linear structure, and they take advantage of covariates on the edges, and a bunch of latent variables, which are your positions in some latent space. And uh, typically, you give them a distribution. You build up uh, in, in various ways, depending on whether you're a Bayesian or non-Bayesian. Uh, as a Bayesian, you have to compute the full posterior distribution. Uh, if we didn't have latent positions, that's trivial. When you la add the latent positions, it messes things up uh, somewhat, so you don't have the simple summary statistics. Um, and if you wanted to put blocks into this, you end up doing things in an ad hoc fashion. MCMC to the rescue, people have made these scale to something like 1,000, although getting the clusters in uh, slows things down. It has excellent properties for small networks. Uh, getting this stuff to scale is uh, the, the tricky thing. There are some papers with different approximations, but it's unclear what they yield, and again, model choice an assessing fit. Third class. So the, this is a class of models that shows up in a bunch of different places. David Bly is going to tell you about a version of this mixed membership idea for topic models uh, analyzing text. The basic idea is blocks are like clusters. And in the cluster world, everything belongs to one and only one cluster. The only problem is we don't know how many clusters there are and what belongs to what cluster. Mixed membership models take that a step further, and everybody belongs to every cluster, but with a probability. So you can think of nodes as having probability vectors and membership vectors. And they tell you about links to blocks. That gets you data for off diagonals. And, um, and you can also build in a block structure. And that's what this model does. Uh, it allows for asymmetries. Uh, you have uh, block parameters. And then you have the mixed membership structure. And you build up hierarchically. And that's how you get control of parameters. Here, you really are being Bayesian. It's pretty hard to avoid it, although there are papers that do the hierarchy and then say they're not doing a Bayesian analysis because they don't put the final distribution at the highest level. Uh, MCMC works for the Samson data. So 18 nodes, we can actually get everything to work. You get to about 30 nodes, and it gets really complicated. And so the methodology of variational approximation is what dominates the work in this area. Variational approximation ideas come out of statistical physics. They're very powerful. And if you think of a posterior distribution, I just described it, but it has bumps. And it's not quite so nice. And what I do is I use an approximating function coming up underneath 
until I get it really snug underneath the distribution I really care about. And I do that with an alternating mechanism that's a distributional form of expectation maximization. And then I use that as my approximation. That scales because you can take advantage of the sparseness and do that really efficiently. So it works like a charm for the genetic network and larger ones. Uh, but we don't know how good the approximations are. Uh, and you can make it scale and do model choice. I have two slides. So I've exposed you to a whole bunch of models. Uh, and you'll notice I've started from a different perspective. The algorithm always comes at the end after the specification. Every one of them, I have to ultimately decide whether the models are useful, whether they actually fit the data reasonably well. And because of the sparseness, uh, we've got new problems. So the typical thing that statisticians and others do for comparing models and for assessing fit is to compare the observed data against what you see, maybe with a penalty function. And, uh, but it requires making a pass through the full data. And as the adjacency matrices and the auxiliary data grow in size, that's a layer on top of everything that nobody is very good at combining with the estimation. And so people just haven't done this very well. And then there's this community detection block structure, which is the motivation for a lot of what people do. And that requires an iteration to discover the blocks. Because just as in clustering, we don't know how many blocks or clusters there are. And uh, in many of these methods, we have to do that. This was just static networks. Most people have dynamic networks. The data are evolving in time, uh, as in social networks online. And we have lots of auxiliary information. In a social network, you know lots of the information about the nodes. You often have covariate information on the links, like text of email messages, um, and other contextual information that may affect different chunks of the network in different ways. So the real problems are embedding the kinds of model-like ideas in settings where you have those data, uh, making it dynamic so that you've got parameters evolving over time, and in a way that you can uh, actually decide if the model fits and um, uh, whether or not you can make suitable predictions, either at an individual level, a community level, or even at the ensemble of a network. Thank you. Thank you. A couple of questions? Go ahead. Yeah. So um, early on, you were describing this observation with the monks that um, friendship need not be symmetric, and you were giving this explanation. But another explanation is that the researchers allow the monks only to list three friends, and you may very well know him, and he's just your fourth best friend, and when you had to choose, you just chose the other three. So uh, a lot of it seems to be an artifact of how questions are worded. How much are we trying now to explain artifacts the way people ask questions? OK, so um, it may well be that the constraints of data gathering create issues. Uh, these data are embedded in the two-year study. We know a lot about the 18Ws. In fact, uh, the thesis from which this is extracted is about that thing. Uh, and the, you could embellish and have weights. So all friends are not alike. After all, you were willing to admit 
that the one that didn't get on at the end wasn't as strong somehow as the other. All of these ideas generalize, and classes of models generalize. And the question is, when is there value in that and when not? And I won't second guess Samson and what he did in his thesis. What I can tell you is that there are big data sets where you can choose to fit whatever models you want, and you're not constrained by the data source. Okay. So it seems like the computational bottleneck is coming by modding this n squared matrix. So if you get a large network, a large fraction of the matrix will be zero. Is there a spectrum? So, so a lot of these algorithms get their scaling properties by taking advantage of the sparseness. But sparseness doesn't mean blocks of zeros necessarily. In large social networks where people are separated in time and space, there are big blocks of zeros where you can exploit that for computation and modeling purposes. Um, and you have to be able to build that in as you scale up. Yeah. One last question. Go ahead. So depending on where you get your data, if it's, for instance, from uh, email communication and stuff like that, how can you tell that uh, people have multiple personalities? So you know, I might have several different email addresses, so, so two people might actually be the same. How does that confuse me? Um, the answer is structuring of the data if you're going to make sense of it. Um, clearly, the issue is how you gather your data and where they come from. So I'm engaged in developing an online, uh, basically a telco for a campus in Singapore. The desktop of every smartphone will be instrumented so that we record what happens on it. There is no sense of multiple identities when you're at that level. There are multiple networks and multiple structures going on, but there, we have information on them. And that's what you want to infer. And there, the auxiliary information is petabytes and above. Great. Thank you very much.